Yeah, I want to get on another update with silver and also related to some of the other things that are uh, myths and also related to the price of diesel fuel. Now, I know I, I'm not somebody who's been in the industry of, uh, you know, mining, but, you know, I've been in the accounting industry and I have seen like expert pro formas and estimates on mines, you know, like what it's going to cost. And of the operating cost in mining, it's like the ongoing operating cost, about, you know, I'm going to say roughly from what I've seen, 50% of it is energy, diesel fuel. Now, you could say, yeah, to use recyclable biofuel, but you know what? It ain't, <laughs> it's like it's just as cheap as you could buy anywhere else. In other words, if it's expensive out there and you got a Mercedes and you can put recycle. Uh, biofuel in or something like that you know what it costs you it's there's no magic there's secret way that the mines get away by paying real low energy cost and everybody else pays high the costs are going up now the junior miners they have a lot I'm just saying this from like accounting ways you know because I can't really say it from a industry insider but I'll give you straight common sense on this. The junior miners, they'll have a large capital upfront outlay, you know, with mining equipment and whatever they paid for land and all these fees for wildlife studies, environmental studies, and permitting or whatever. The established mines can say, oh, we're not going to do any more, you know, looking for <laughs> capital outlays for looking to expand since the price is down. We're just going to continue our operations bare bones as possible. So they can, they can actually, you know, do, they could survive better. The bigger guys had been established because they could just go along with what they have and keep costs to a minute minimum. But like I said, the operational cost, it's about half, it's very energy intensive. I think it's about half of the operational cost is diesel fuel. Now, I'm pr it's pretty close to that. It's pretty close to that. So like a newer startup venture, forget about it. They're sunk. So like, you know, the junior miners are getting killed, you know. And that's the common sense thing where you know the price of silver is too low. Now, I know like there's people out there with silver's money and fiat paper, and you look at a piece of paper, you know, this piece of paper's not worth anything, you know, because... But I'll tell you this, I mean, during the Great Depression, this paper can work. It depends on who manages it. And actually, the problem is the managers become corrupt. You know, it's just like, no, you know, we know this about gold has that discipline, whatever. But, you know, paper can work. During the Great Depression in the 1930s in Austria, in a country of Austria, they issued, like, um, some type of government, some kind of government notes. I forgot exactly how they did it, but... It was just paper notes, and um, they could be redeemable in the Austrian currency, but they were actually issued by the local governments. They were local currencies, and they were paper. It turned out, when they issued it into the public, it wound up having such a high velocity of money that the economy was actually stimulated. It was it, They didn't even need to issue anywhere near what they thought they had to issue, and they didn't have inflation. Like, paper money can work. You know what the problem is with our the regular paper money that's in all the big central banks and everything? The central bank lends the money to the government at interest. In other words, if Congress created the paper directly and put it into the economy as needed, you know, if the growth of the economy was, uh, you know, the economy was growing a lot, and if Congress said, "Well, we need to raise the money supply a little bit to meet." the demand because there's so much goods and services flowing back and forth. We gotta, you know, raise the money supply a little bit. And if they put paper and electronic currency into the market and it didn't cost any interest, hey that could work. You know the problem is you know the problem is it's with interest. It's a scam. So I'm just putting this right back to one oh one. That's really kind of why you're getting silver. You're just saying, hey, I ain't taking part in that shit. You know? Because you know it's a Ponzi scam. Now, I want to get back to these um, diesel prices and stuff. And, you know, if you go way back, 
January 1995, diesel was $1.10. Now, silver was only like a few bucks or something like that. And yes, silver did get ahead of itself when it got up to 48. You know, it did get ahead of itself. But with all the cost of everything that what it's costing the miners to produce, it's gonna ha it would have to be about 35 bucks for them to start doing pretty good. Or more. At 40, they'd be doing good. They'd be doing really good. They'd be doing pretty good. 50, they'd be doing stellar. But, you know, I don't think that's the whole deal of why the price is going to go up. I think it's, you know, like part of it is like Mark Faber says. He's afraid of a global, systemic financial collapse. That is really why gold and silver is going to go ballistic. Panic. There is going to be a collapse at one point in time. There's too much shenanigans going on, too many Ponzi schemes going on. And when some people get caught, they're going to run out of options. They, they're going to be running out of currencies and going in. See, I don't really particularly like gold too much because it actually isn't used in anything. It's just considered money. And I know paper can be considered money. Because it's just basically a medium of exchange. It's a guise. It's really, you know, paper money can work. Depends on who manages it. But we got Ponzi scheme operators managing our paper money. That's the problem. Like I said, sometimes it works in certain situations. But, you know, looking back at, you know, the price of silver when it was really, really low, diesel fuel was really low. And if you go all the way back, you know, during the Clinton administration, I mean, silver wasn't worth crap. I mean, a few bucks, four bucks or something like that. Price of diesel was like a dollar three, you know, things like that. It was low, very low. And then when we saw silver go up to like 22 in two th early 2008, that's when oil started taking off and everything. Well, what I think is the oil companies are greedy bastards. They're, they're going to keep the price of oil high. I know there's more and more oil being produced in the United States, demand is low. But you know, I agree, I agree with that one thing Lindsey Williams said about the uh, them wanting to uh, create tension in the Middle East and also cut off China from oil, and they want to have get as much as possible for the price of oil. You know, the oil companies. Actually, if there's one industry out there that's freaking God on earth, it's freaking oil industries, man. They run the freaking Bigger than countries, you know what I mean? You know, and Vladimir Putin's part of that shit, too. Don't we'll let him fool you, man. He ain't no freaking anti-Illuminati Western elite guy. He's a, another racket in unto himself. But uh, the price of diesel actually is, is the problem, where the mines are not going to be able to operate at a profit at even the low prices we are now. Even at 25, it's too freaking low. At 30, most of the mines can't freaking operate at a profit. Then you also have to figure even the larger miners, they can, you know, scale back, not do any capital expenditures. They can operate. They're not going to buy new equipment. They're not going to look for new areas of metals where the metals are and stuff. They're not going to pour that much money into that. What happens when the supply starts getting low of the stuff that they can mine that they'd already discover in their ongoing existing operations. It's a finite resource. Then they actually have to go and pay money to uh, buy land, do wildlife studies, environmental studies, permitting, engineers, geothermal study, I don't know, whatever the hell they gotta do. And uh, equipment, equipment's expensive as shit too. And then, you know, there's a problem of water. You know, mining's a very not just energy intensive environment, it's also water. And you know, that's another thing that can even uh, consume more energy if they actually have to truck the water in or make a canal or irrigation. See what I mean? If you got existing operation, you can go like skeleton crew. But you know, once that those supplies run down, I'm not saying the supply of the earth is gonna run out, but you know what I mean? The existing stuff that they can run on the skeleton crew starts going down. What happens then? That's why I know the scenario is not going to continue. What I think where it's going to go way the hell up is a panic. That's, that, you know, is where Mark Farber has a lot of his money into gold. Now, I like palladium, though, better than gold. 
because you, know, you see it's never been money. I really don't give a shit if it's never been money. I look at it like this. You got a bigger and bigger metal class developing in all parts of the world, including like Saudi Arabia and Iran and Iraq, where people, you know, in those oil producing countries, their people in those countries are buying cars. And it's automotive production that consumes 65% of the palladium out of there for catalytic converters. And palladium is like 20 times more rare than gold. And on a large ticket item like a car, well, guess what? Guess what? I mean, if the price of palladium even doubled, I mean, it's going to raise the price of the car 150, 200 bucks out of a car that's 20 to 30 thousand dollars on average, and they can affect people. They'll still buy the car. They ain't going to freaking keep them from, uh, you know, that wouldn't like cause the uh, the demand for palladium to go down, <laughs> right? Now, also, you know, I pointed out some other things on the flip side, like with the price of silver. Say silver went up to 150 to $200 an ounce, like really high, right? Really, really high. Oh, they would definitely find different ways not to use silver. You say it can't be done? Oh, it can be done. Actually, I think, um, I don't know, maybe copper, I'm not an engineer, but I know like with these there's certain types of copper, ultra pure copper, that are used in electronic circuits. You wouldn't use that over the price of silver right now, but maybe there'd be ways to make that ultra pure copper cheaper, or coat things, and or get away with using a lot less silver, where you can bring the demand down. I just think that the precious metals are going to go up due to a, like what Mark Faber says, there's going to be a collapse of the Ponzi scheme that's going on, because it's not so much that it's fiat paper per se it's the, the fact that um, the central banks which aren't run by people right it's not like a bank that's an entity out of some place it's like you know just a building there there's people making money um, they lend money to governments they want government to get in debt which means the people to get in debt which means they lend it to them you know they create money out of thin air and because it's just fiat paper, and then it's paid back with interest. So, I mean, you know, they're going to break. That's what they're looking to do. There's actually, the system probably will break at one point in time. And it's like, I don't think it's as far off as you think, because, you know, like people are looking at the price of metals to judge exactly what's going on in the inflation situation. But that's not the whole story. And, you know, here's the other thing with inflation. Here's the big question. You know, Ben Bernanke's a liar, right? You'll agree with that because this is conspiracy stuff that people go on his channel. kind of. I think Ben Bernanke, he's probably doing the best he can, but he's a scammer too. I mean, about ending QE, that can end QE. But here's the question. The Fed, it keeps buying up more and more um, securities, right? And real estate loans and bad loans from banks, right? You know, loans that got upside down. That's actually why the bank sector is actually doing fine because um, they are um, you know being propped up by Federal Reserve policies right and actually the parts of the stock market that are doing good are like the big banks big insurance companies and everything because any problem they have the Fed just buys it up you know they if they got bad loans or whatever they're holding bad paper the Fed buys it up right problem is how does the Fed unwind its balance sheet you know, you know. In other words, if all this money that was being created went into the economy per se, you know, the mom and pop shops and everything, we'd have rampant inflation, right? But it's not. It's actually being held on the balance sheets. You know, the one the big banks are holding like Federal Reserve notes and stuff like that, and then uh, the Fed is buying up all this bad paper. It's just sitting on the balance sheets. It's not really getting into the economy. How are they going to unwind the balance sheets? See, that's the thing I always talked about with uh, central bank policy. They try to stimulate the economy, stimulate the economy. And guess what happens? It's like building up more and more water behind a wall of a dam. And actually, before hyperinflation hits, I don't know if we're going into like hyper, hyperinflation, but I think we are going to go into serious inflation. Um, before hyperinflation hits or serious inflation hits, there's always a pullback. It's always like, what happens before a tidal wave? Water goes out, right? Water goes out, and guess what happens? Then the water comes in hard. It's, 
I don't want to just put it out there as like a, a, a you know a tidal wave example, but you know like that's since a tidal wave works like that, that's the way the economy is going to work. But it is true. Take a look at what happens when what precedes hard inflation, and then also ask yourself. How is the Federal Reserve going to unwind its balance sheet? It can't. It's going to have to continue this policy. When Ben Bernanke says we're thinking about ending QE, no. No, that ain't going to happen. So just uh, continue on. And uh, I don't know exactly where, where prices silver could go because I was surprised that it can go this low. Um, I figured 24 and a half. I know some people said 22 was a line on the sand. I don't know. Now, we also can look last year, though, everybody, last summer in 2012, when price went down to 26, everybody was expecting 22, 20, 18, and then it went up, right? So, I mean, usually when everybody's jumping on one side, it goes the other way around. I mean, you can't really always go by that, but a lot of times that happens. So, you know, I think it's a good bet, though. I think it's a good bet, so I'm sticking with my bet. I'm not really worried about it, but I understand why it's going to go up, you know. Oh, by the way, if you notice, I got on here, I was doing the blood pulsing, this, that thing. This is actually not the one by Mike Forrest. This is another one by Silver Smoke Research, and you notice the exact points I have them on, like one right here and one right here, and you can feel a little zap, zap, zap. You know, that's the uh, thing where it clobbers uh, parasites and stuff like that, so... You know, a lot of people think that's snake oil. I don't know. <laughs> Who the hell knows? But, you know, a lot of people think silver snake oil, too. You know? But, yeah, we might get onto some other marketing campaign for silver because I, I think there's, there's a faster way to dry up the supply of silver and take it out of the hands of, you know, you know, basically put a lot more demand on the miners than just selling coins. And uh, I have some other ideas besides, uh, you know, cups with boobs on them and stuff so we shall see